Hello, everyone who is already on the call. We are going to start in three minutes. Good morning, good afternoon. I'm Benedict from the Secretariat of the Network for Improving Quality of Care for Maternal, Newborn and Child Health. Welcome everyone to this third webinar in a series on transforming care for small and sick newborns. The series is organized by the World Health Organization and UNICEF in collaboration with the Network for Improving Quality of Care for Maternal, Newborn and Child Health. You will see that today all the, the participants who are joining today are being muted, but we want to have a conversation with you in the chat. So please, while the presenters today are going to the presentation, type your question and comments in the chat box, which you should, you should find at the bottom right corner of your screen. And please send it to me, the host, or to all panelists, because otherwise we will not be able to see them all. Thank you. I'd like to introduce you to the moderator, facilitator for today's discussion. Um, it's Dr. Ted Bardegefi Hele Gabriel, who is a senior advisor on maternal newborn health at UNICEF in New York, and she will run you run you through this session. Ted Bab. Thank you, Benny. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning, colleagues. Thank you for joining uh, this uh, the third webinar on transforming care for every uh, small and sick newborn. Uh, so today we will have uh, our session. Next slide, uh, Benny, please. So we have uh, in today's session, we have uh, uh, the authors of the report. Uh, just a minute. Yeah, so uh, today's webinar will be on uh, the third chapter on deliver uh, the care they need. So in this webinar, we have uh, the authors of the report, uh, two of the authors, Dr. Ornella Lincheto and Dr. Sarah Moxan. Uh, Dr. Ornella is uh, a pediatrician and a neonatologist, and she is currently a senior medical officer for newborn health uh, at WHO, and uh, she was the lead uh, editor of the report and uh, Dr. Sarah Moxon, also the research fellow at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. She contributed to the report. So they will take us to the chapter uh, which it says deliver the care they are entitled to. As I said earlier, this is this would be the third chapter of the report. And then we will have uh, a presentation on the finding of the Nairobi 
uh, newborn study on effective coverage on newborn services. This will be delivered by Dr. Uh, David, who is assistant professor in health system at the NIST 360 program at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And then we will have uh, a presentation on uh, technology and innovation, uh, defining the characteristics of innovation to support uh, the care of newborn in low resource setting by uh, Cara Parmount, who is a co-PI for the Newborn Essential Solutions and Technologies or NIST 360 degree. And then I will take you on um, the COVID-19 in pregnant women and the newborns, the latest guidance. And then we will have uh, questions and answer. And uh, as Benny said, please direct your questions to all panelists in the chat box. So now I will invite uh, Dr. Ornella Lincetto. Be delivered to whole small and sick newborns. And this chapter has uh, three key messages. Um, ensuring uh, the first is that cost effective and evidence based solutions are available to prevent uh, avoidable um, uh, newborn deaths and disability. And uh, we need, of course, uh, to ensure that these interventions are delivered with uh, high coverage and also quality. Quality care requires an integrated, resilient health system, multidisciplinary teams, and innovation. And finally, we need also to address the inequities in care and therefore reaching uh, the vulnerable groups. So for the um, survival, to improve survival and the possibly survival without disability, uh, we must reach all newborns in need of care. With high coverage with the high quality of a dignified care. So what does it mean? It means that uh, the intervention that are uh, high impact and cost effective to address uh, uh, the needs of uh, small and sick newborns need to be incorporated in the universal care packages of countries. We know it's not sufficient, uh, however, uh, to reach a high coverage of this intervention. We need also to uh, ensure that the, the quality is good. And, uh, and this means also incorporated the uh, delivery uh, models of care that are family center. And uh, one example, WHO and uh, WHO and UNICEF and Partners has launched in February 2017, the Quality, Equity, and Dignity Network for Improving Quality of Care for Maternal, Newborn, and Child Health with the objective of uh, reducing by 50% maternal and newborn mortality and stillbirths within five years in the facilities that are uh, uh, part of this uh, project. And uh, the quality of care framework that is used in the chapter is also the framework uh, that uh, is used for, um, for, uh, in, for implementing, uh, let's say, the, uh, the activities in our focus countries, set out, set out uh, the values of the quality, equity, dignity, and the focus on how uh, a system should can improve the quality of care by looking at the provision of care as well as at the experience of care through eight domains that uh, will uh, allow us to ensure good quality services that are evidence-based, are well organized, accessible, and uh, adequately resourced, but also services that are uh, safe and people-centered and can ensure in this way optimal clinical de developmental and social outcomes for all small and sick and newborns. Now, for the uh, sustaining and uh, and for being successful in uh, in call and uh, and providing uh, quality care, leadership within uh, L, L, within countries need to cultivate a culture of evidence-based practice among uh, care providers, and uh, countries need protocols, guidelines, uh, point of service delivery and the WHO to, uh, has developed a number of standards in order to assist in this process. So you see in the picture the standards for improvement, improving quality of maternal and neonatal care in health facilities and soon 
we will um, uh, publish also standards uh, uh, on the care uh, of small and sick newborns. And this can be used by countries to develop their national standards, their national protocols, as well as uh, uh, updating the education program and the training materials. Angeloma de Care is one of the intervention that uh, is really uh, evidence-based, is uh, has demonstrated a high impact on survival, on uh, brain development as well, uh, uh, benefits uh, uh, in, for the families and for the care systems, as you can see in the slide. However, it's not yet uh, implemented at scale, and this is one uh, you know, it's just an example on uh, of the intervention that we would like to promote uh, across uh, all over the world and uh, and be incorporated also in the universal care packages. And then uh, um, special attention also should be paid to delivering de developmentally supported care to small and sick newborns. We know that uh, excessive uh, handling and in general uh, procedures in neonatal care can disturb and involve sleep and well-being and even growth. And so uh, and care providers need to ensure in a healing environment that uh, uh, facilitate the contact with parents, reduce disturbance and provides the correct position, light and sounds and, uh, uh, and uh, minimize pain. Um, pain, actually, we know that uh, small and sick newborns are, are often exposed to painful procedures in the, in the, in the process of care. And uh, at the same time, we also have learned that pain can affect uh, uh, brain development. So uh, we really would like to encourage uh, care providers to uh, put in place uh, evidence-based guidelines to prevent pain as well as uh, prepare the care providers in uh, recognizing uh, pain cues in the newborns as well as uh, in being able to, of preventing and treating uh, uh, pain. For the second part that is more on uh, you know the the um, component of or if you like of the health system uh, we uh, we know that uh, for survive for newborn uh, small and sick newborn to survive and thrive, the family must be able to access uh, appropriate uh, level of care, and uh, which uh, within uh, the system. And this is an uh, uh, are the simplification, if you like, uh, through three levels of care, where uh, the of course the majority all babies should be should have access to immediate and essential newborn care because, uh, you know, um, it's, uh, it's essential, <laughs> basically, and uh, is required by all uh, the 140 million uh, babies per year. But um, we also know, and we learned from the previous the, the webinar last week, uh, that about 30 million babies requires care, inpatient care, because of some kind of virus condition or prematurity and so on. And so about 20 or 30 million of them can be managed through uh, uh, special newborn care, through in neonatal units at the uh, level of district hospital, secondary level care, with uh, intervention that are uh, uh, rather low cost. And only a minority, let's say between eight and 10 million baby may require intensive neonatal care, which includes a mechanical ventilation, advanced feeding support, and a more sophisticated care, and a more uh, complex also care and more resources. And these are uh, probably the, uh, are actually the, the severe premature babies or the severe uh, sepsis, the, the, really the, the very low birth weight. Uh, and in order to ensure that the care is provided at the proper level uh, uh, in the health system uh, within a network of facilities as, as well within uh, uh, with appropriate referral system, as we, we would like to see, uh, uh, we need also to put in place uh, to ensure physical resources. And these uh, uh, resources are listed here. I, uh, for example, infrastructure is something that, uh, and within the infrastructure, the space is something that uh, we all struggle. I mean, the clinicians are struggling very much to ensure. 
particularly now that we want to have a space, uh, a sufficient space for accommodating the parents, the mother for kangaroo mother care, but the visiting parents in the neonatal units, uh, but also we need uh, technologies, medicines, equipment and diagnostics that are appropriate for uh, uh, neonate, neonates and that are safe uh, and they are uh, of good quality and uh, all that requires, of course, innovation. And uh, to conclude with uh, innovation, we know that innovative uh, and cost-effective technologies, but also approaches have the potential to accelerate uh, process and access to quality of care for small and sick newborns. And with here uh, examples from uh, countries, this is a, an example of uh, uh, using an integrated approach and so through the from assessment to, to care in Burkina Faso. We heard from the webinar in the morning and we will hear more from uh, examples from uh, Kenya and others later on in this uh, webinar. I would like to hand over hand over for uh, to Sara for the uh, to continue the presentation on the on the quality of care requirements. Thank you, Onella. Um, moving on from the what is needed to provide care, provide care onto the who provides the care for small and sick newborns. Um, fundamental to the provision of quality care for small and sick newborns is consideration of the people that provide that care. And we know that small and sick newborns require multidisciplinary teams of competent, competent and motivated health professionals. The majority of that care will be provided by nurses. We know through studies carried out in neonatal units that the survival of small and sick newborns is closely linked to the number of nurses working per shift. And this is um, critical as we know that um, nursing numbers and health workforce overall is a significant gap in many low and middle income countries. But it's not just numbers of uh, health professionals and nurses for providers to be able to deliver quality of care and people centered care. Um, attention needs to be paid to a number of things. Um, thinking about attracting treatment policies. So that's perhaps consideration of accommodation or housing for um, facilities based in more remote areas, performance recognition for um, nurses that um, are providing high levels of care, appropriate remuneration, good working conditions, and of course, newly deployed nurses will need conditions of care for small and sick newborns and um, opportunities to be mentored. Testing is going to be an important part of this process, um, particularly where there are uh, shortages in the health workforce. And, and this is a process of delegation whereby tasks can be moved where appropriate to less specialised health workers. Um, and this needs to be formalised to prevent any confusion in roles and responsibilities on the neonatal unit. We need strong pre-service education in neonatal care, especially um, for nurses, but also for doctors as well and thinking about expansion of uh, neonatal cadre in nursing if it exists, or a phased approach to introducing neonatal nursing cadres in, in different countries. We also need innovation, education and mentoring to improve quality of care and creating linkages through um, universities and facilities for quality improvement programmes. Next slide. Can we have the next slide? Yes, I'm trying. <laughs> um, so it's not just uh, house workers that provide care to small and sick newborns. The family experience of care is a key aspect. And it's not just mothers as well, but also fathers and um, in many cases, extended family that may be involved in the care of small and sick newborns. The health system values, culture and leadership needs to be supportive of family-centred care and policies and practices and resources need to be aligned accordingly. There are numerous benefits to involving families in the care of small and sick newborns, although it is important to note and increasingly research is showing us that parental involvement should not exceed the parents' comfort levels and is not a substitute for qualified staff. Some of the benefits of involving families in the care of small and sick newborns include boosting parent and newborn attachment, ensure, ensuring higher breastfeeding rates, 
facilitating earlier discharge from the neonatal unit, improving longer term de neurodevelopment for babies, encouraging reciprocal cue based interaction between parents and their babies, promoting developmentally supportive care, and in the longer term, improving health related knowledge and beliefs among parents and community. Next slide. So the next slide really shows us how nurses can act as leaders for quality improvement. We know that nurses provide the majority of care to small and sick newborns and are well positioned to be the primary drivers of change and leaders in quality improvement. This approach is really a way of simultaneously empowering the nursing cadre and, and institutionalizing quality improvement in neonatal care delivery. Um, this shows, slide shows us numerous examples of nurses becoming drivers of change and catalysts in quality improvement, despite the challenging circumstances they may be working in in different settings. Next slide. So now we're moving on to the next section on transform, thinking about how we can reduce barriers and discrimination to reach all newborns and families. Next slide. Under the Convention of Rights of the Child, it's a fundamental right for newborns and their families to be able to access the healthcare that they need. Currently, there is limited data on the overall proportion of small and sick newborns who can access care. Um, but over time, developing ways to measure effective coverage could support evidence based planning to make sure that we improve access to quality care services. It's really important to create equal opportunities for all newborns to access care and some particularly vulnerable groups that we need to think about are migrants and ethnic minorities, girl newborns who are often subjected in some settings, also newborns with congenital abnormalities, and those newborns that do not have families or may have been abandoned or orphaned. And the importance of all of this um, is underlined by the fact that neonatal mortality is usually highest for babies that are born into the poorest households. Next slide. The next slide shows results of a study carried out on effective coverage of newborn services in Nairobi, Kenya. And um, this study supplied evidence to policymakers and providers to improve service planning, quality, and care delivery. And David Katara is going to talk to us in, in more detail about this a little bit later. So we'll um, move on from this slide now. The next slide shows us how China has addressed some of the social and financial barriers. Um, and then moving on to the next slide. A very important issue um, that's highlighted in this slide is newborn health and humanitarian crisis. Um, if we look at the table on the right, we can see that of the 16 countries with the highest neonatal mortality rate, 11 have experienced recent humanitarian crises. So based on that, any global response to improve maternal, newborn and child health must include an explicit focus on humanitarian settings and mobilization to ensure the delivery of protective and life-saving resources. And this will be exacerbated by the current global situation with COVID-19. There are a number of guidelines uh, available on service provision for newborns in humanitarian settings, which are shown in the bottom left of this slide. And this includes the um, newly revised uh, Newborn Health and Humanitarian Settings Field Guide. There's also the Minimum Initial Service Package for Reproductive Health in Crisis Settings the Interagency Field Manual on Reproductive Health and Humanitarian Settings, and the Core Operational um, Guidelines on Infant Feeding in Emergency. Next slide. To, to conclude, in order to end preventable newborn and child deaths, care for small and sick newborns requires higher coverage of quality neonatal services, with family-centered models of care that are organized in a network of facilities with functional referral systems. We need a sufficient number of healthcare providers, especially focusing on nursing, with skills to care for small and sick newborns that work in partnership with parents and families. And of course, we need to think carefully about how we can reach marginalized populations and those that are most vulnerable. Thank you. 
I'm now passing over to David Gattara to talk about um, the newborn study in Kenya. David, you're on mute. David, you need to unmute yourself. Okay, I'm unmuting you now, David. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, please, please go ahead. You were on mute for the first few seconds. All right. All right. So I walk us through uh, the Nairobi newborn uh, study, um, Kenyan uh, Kenya case study on effective coverage of essential inpatient newborn services in Nairobi, and which had a lot of collaborators and was funded by the team below. Um, and just to give a background of Nairobi, we have a population of about 5 million, 60 to 70% of uh, informal settlements. Um, it, it, about 88% uh, deliveries within health facilities, uh, but Nairobi has one of the highest neonatal mortality rate of 39 per thousand against uh, the national average of 22 per thousand. So the Nairobi newborn study focused on estimating um, the need for newborn services and then exploring how, determining of that of the babies that require uh, these newborn services. Uh, what proportion of them access these services in what type of facilities and of the facilities providing this what kind of quality of care were they providing in terms of uh, structural assessment so the resources available to provide care but also the process of care again is the, um, established standards and guidelines and finally to assess the knowledge of nurses who are the major um, providers of newborn care in these units um, so just to delve in, into the results, um, so we started off by using uh, population projections for 2015 and using epidemiological methods, um, uh, estimated what proportion of babies uh, for the most common illnesses and applying those preferences to the population to determine uh, what proportion of babies require uh, inpatient newborn care services and we estimated that to about um, 22,000 uh, babies, and this translates to about 18% of all live births happening in Nairobi requiring patient newborn care, and that's about one in five. And we um, evaluated uh, facilities providing 24-7 inpatient care and went to these facilities, reviewed the registers to determine uh, what, what, how many babies were actually admitted uh, in these uh, facilities for the same period, and that came to about 12,000. And that translated to about 45% um, of the babies not uh, accessing inpatient neonatal care services uh, uh, in Nairobi or access them in a facility that didn't have the capacity to provide them. So to understand this a little bit more, we uh, had a special distribution of the babies and neonatal care services across um, Nairobi, and we can see that those are the different administrative regions, and, and the darker the shade means the higher the need for inpatient neonatal care, and layered uh, the facilities providing 24-7 uh, uh, inpatient neonatal care services, and we can see some form of maldistribution between facilities and uh, where the greatest need is. And to just uh, understand better the sort of places where neonatal inpatient care was being provided. We see in panel A that um, majority were private hospitals, 23, uh, with only four public facilities. And of these four public health facilities, they were provided, they were providing 71% of the inpatient neonatal care uh, to the 12,000 babies um, that were admitted during the period of study. And again, uh, despite the private sector contributing a quite a significant um, number of facilities, most of these are inaccessible. As you can see, they have 
uh, quite high costs in panel B, and that translates to very low occupancy rates um, in panel D and high occupancy rates in uh, public sector, uh, which uh, was more affordable um, to most of the people in Nairobi. So, delving into the quality of care being provided, with that to how well care provided was uh, as per required norms and standards, uh, using a threshold of 60% of um, uh, consistency with standards, we see only about 24%. Um, sorry, with regards to structural assessment, we see most facilities had the resources required uh, to provide yeah, neonatal education uh, with over 80% of that being provided. Pulling together all these findings, uh based on the structure the process and the knowledge of nurses and applying it to the population estimated to require patient care uh we see that um uh, only about 24 percent of babies uh could uh access um quality care uh within this population and but the major missing piece in uh all this quality uh quality care work and standard quality of care assessment is nursing care, which uh, aims at reviewing, and we know that nursing is responsible for uh, delivering most of the interventions uh, that are required in um, most disciplines, And but delivering is not important, but delivering them in continuous and consistently high quality care. And we embarked on a direct observation of study to quantify nursing care delivered within newborn units in Nairobi. And these span six hospitals, spanning uh, the different uh, sectors, public, private, and private not profit. And what we learned from this work, so we each of the dots represents a baby. And what we did was uh, observe babies over 12 hour shift and determined how much nursing care that or how much nursing tasks were required over this 12 hour period and observed the, of the nursing tasks required what proportion of them were delivered. And that's what you have on the y-axis as the nursing quality index. And on the x-axis is the number of babies the nurse was looking after. And uh, as you can see, as the number of babies the nurse was looking after increases, the, uh, the care provided um, decre decreased. And the maroon dots that represent the public sector on average had less than 50% of the nursing care required um, delivered. And using a threshold of 80% of the nursing care required to be delivered uh, as a threshold for high quality care, then we see uh, none of the babies in the public sector achieved that. So to put that into perspective in terms of a cascade of coverage of quality care, then we see we start off with a population of 100%, which is uh, everyone requiring um, patient care, then 56% uh, had a service contract, 46% uh, had uh, some form of service readiness facility interaction, only 25% had basic adjusted quality care. And when you apply the nursing, adjust, nursing quality adjustment, then you see 0% in the public sector, despite the public sector delivering 70, over 70% of the care. So to summarize is one in five uh, uh, live births will require inpatient care. Um, there's poor effective coverage of essential neonatal services. And th this might be associated with the inadequate provision, but uh, 5% do not have access. Um, quality is uh, needed with only 25 having access uh, to high quality and 0%, that's nothing adjusted, only for public, for public health facilities and with my distribution where there is the greatest need. And so to do, to improve quality, then we need to expand uh, appropriate uh, hits, especially nursing, but also in, important to improve on the availability of resources and quality provision. And uh, to better address some of these challenges is we need to upgrade some of the facilities to ensure better coverage, uh, strengthen existing facilities and ensure a, a, a better referral strategy that addresses equity and priorities. Thank you to all the people who participated in this and a lot of the challenges we've identified are being addressed by colleagues in the uh, next 360 program of work and i'll now hand over to dr Kara, who will tell us a little bit about the next 360.
Great, thank you, David, um, so much for that uh, presentation. Um, as we talk about quality neonatal services, there's a variety of different um, components, and I'd like to focus on the technology and innovation component of that, which is one of many important uh, components. Um, we know that there are providers uh, such as the nurses that um, uh, David just mentioned lack um, tools they need to deliver quality newborn care. But what tools are out there? One of the things that we spent the last 18 months doing is creating a compendium of technologies and innovations that are either commercially available already or that are in development. And we have this tool that's a public good um, featuring 63 innovations from 29 different organizations that um, defines what's currently uh, available. We update this every six months. And in fact, at the end of June, we'll be having an update to this um, landscape with 70 innovations and 30 from 31 organizations. So there are some technologies out there um, and, and, and being worked on, but we are also, also very familiar with the challenges that the existing technologies present. Um, they may not be affordable. They may not be defined, uh, rugged enough for the settings um, that we're talking about. And um, they, they may, have challenges and resulting in equipment graveyards that we're unfortunately all too familiar with. Um, so the NEST 360 project in, in, in parallel to developing the landscape also uh, worked on a target product profile effort to define characteristics for innovations that are needed um, that can help uh, deliver affordable, rugged, effective, and easy to use uh, innovations for newborns and hospitals in low resource settings. So we created TPPs or target product profiles to define what's needed and what's affordable uh, for 16 product categories. And included in these, um, the majority of, the, of these technologies fall within respiratory support, as you see from this diagram. But we also focus on diagnostics and some of the other um, categories that Ornella mentioned as physical resources. Um, what was our process for developing these TPPs? Well, we included and, and many people on this call in a Delphi-like process to um, inform the development. So we started with a draft of target product profiles featuring 20 or so characteristics that um, for each of these product categories that would define uh, affordable, rugged, and easy to use. We then sent out a survey to about 180 uh, stakeholders um, and got 103 responses from uh, 22 countries, including folks, uh, clinicians, implementers, and, and ministries of health. Um, we took that survey and looked at where we agreed on the characteristics for each product category and where we disagreed. And where we disagreed, we held a consensus meeting in Stellenbosch in South Africa with over 70, uh, 69 people attending. And we defined um, where we disagreed on, on characteristics. So whether something was truly affordable or, and we, all, we agreed on that, or whether something was rugged enough um, for, um, for use in, in low resource settings. And I'm happy to say that we took the report, uh, findings from that meeting and from this process and have published as well as 16 TPPs on the UNICEF website. Um, so there's a lot of colorful um, commentary uh, about what was discussed at the meeting, what the learnings from the, the survey were, and hopefully will better guide um, the development of new products that will support um, newborn care, high quality newborn care in low resource settings. Um, so I'd like to thank UNICEF. Um, many of those uh, on the call um, helped support this process um, as we uh, embarked on it 18 months ago. And, um, and I'd also like to thank a lot of the people on this call that participated in this process and provided input. Um, so now I'd like to turn it over uh, to Ted Bob um, um, from UNICEF, who will now talk about um, COVID and newborn care. Sonela, you have the slides again.
the COVID-19 slide. Okay, so uh, thank you all presenters, Cara, David, Sarah and uh, Ornilla taking us through this important document. So I will present just a few slides because now COVID has become now our reality where we operate and deliver services. Uh, uh, with the current information we have uh, from observational studies, epidemiological studies, uh, what we have seen is uh, that uh, COVID is not directly affecting pregnant women, uh, but pregnant women are at increased risk of mortality because of the reduced access to health facility uh, with uh, skilled birth attendants and uh, quality of care. Uh, we have seen this and also uh, we have the recent publication also has shown us what that negative, uh, neg the impact of that uh, service disruption would be. Uh, although also newborns are less likely uh, to die directly from COVID, uh, the same as you know, pregnant mothers, they are now at increased risk of mortality from uh, other preventable treatment, uh, treatable condition as access and availability of health services are disrupted because of you know, the measures that now governments are putting in place. So uh, taking this into mind, you know, WHO working with uh, partners has developed uh, certain key documents that will help countries to develop uh, strategies in place to maintain essential health services. And the maternal newborn child adolescent health services are one of the components of essential health services. So there are now operational guidance on maintaining essential health services during outbreak and also community-based health care, uh, including outreach and campaigns in the context of COVID, and also maintaining essential health services operational guidance in the context of uh, COVID. And in this, uh, when you look at chapter two, you will see a life course and disease consideration and the documents are available on this. And maintaining uh, uh, in uh, countries are advised, you know, to consider their capacity, both at health facility and community level, uh, looking at their system, and they need to ensure all uh, elements of antenatal care and postnatal to be maintained. Uh, by doing, you know, prioritizing high-risk mothers and newborns, uh, and also ensuring the target outreach strategies and uh, catch up contacts on the exploring using digital platform to do counseling and screening for danger signs in uh, remote uh, uh, approach and also uh, the, the guideline also clearly puts out that skilled care should be available at all time for mothers and uh, newborns uh, including a referral for management of complication and, uh, you know, respectful care, uh, allowing birth companion, uh, supporting uh, breast milk and early initiation of uh, breastfeeding. All this should not be eroded, actually, more than ever. They should be maintained, encouraged, supported. And also ensuring, you know, critical commodities that are important to prevent or manage complication during antenatal care childbirth and the postnatal care should be ensured. Uh, when we look at the care of small and sick newborn, uh, but possible adaptations, you know, that needs to be considered are, of course, primarily the you know, optimal infection prevention control uh, and personal protective equipment and, uh, I mean, supplies should be available. Uh, and also limiting the number of care uh, providers, for example, for kangaroo mother care, uh, you know, needs to be uh, limited. And also developing uh, strategies to enable and support to, uh, to continue kangaroo mother care at home. In this, uh, you know, um, we have to consider uh, properly training and orienting and supporting family members uh, to do that and also considering you know a home visit approach might be uh, a useful strategy uh, if uh, 
families are well supported and engaged in the care. As we have heard you know, in the presentation, early discharge with the follow up can be a feasible approach uh, for preterm and low birth weight. Uh, and also, parents need to be uh, screened for COVID before entering into the NICU. And uh, there is also a clinical management of COVID-19, uh, which was released in early March. So you, you can access that guideline also in this, um, in this uh, WHO's uh, website. Uh, so I think this is my last slide. So now I will give the, the, the part for uh, Benny to uh, manage the answers and questions session. Benny, to you. Thank you very much, uh, Ted Bar and all the speakers today. We had a few questions coming in um, as you were presenting. Um, the first one about about the the overall presentation of the chapter from Lexi Manu, saying that babies uh, of babies of adolescent and young mother are also an adolescent and new mother are also vulnerable. Is there a reason why they're not being added added to the list of vulnerable babies? It will increase the focus for targeting intervention for such babies as well. So I suppose that's for Onela and Sarah. You need to unmute yourself. Thank you for the question. Uh, it is a very true reality that uh, uh, adolescent uh, are, are uh, a vulnerable group. And uh, even if it is not <laughs> mentioned there in the slides, it is mentioned in the report. Uh, because adolescents are also a group that is um, more prone to have uh, preterm babies as well. So, yes, in the report uh, you will find uh, this uh, in, the, in the discussion. Okay, thank you. Um, are we, we're hearing a, a, some drilling sound behind. Can you please mute yourself if, if this is your background noise? No, yeah, sorry. sorry, Benny, it's mine. I'll keep the mic for me. Thank you. Um, there was a question about what it means for what it means to be a qualified nurse. Um, and that um, in, in the presentation, you talk about the need for qualified nurse. But what are the qualifications, what is required, and what do we mean by qualified nurse? Because in low- and middle-income countries, there is no requirement apart from basic midwifery um, to care for small and sick babies. So what are the global guidance uh, to stipulate what this means? I think um, Onella can also speak to this, but I think that that, that is one of the great, great challenges that we need um, to define the exact competencies that are needed to care for small and sick newborns so that cadres can be developed in different countries. I think that um, it's hugely important to not only uh, the, the breadth of nursing as a career is huge and there are a number of different specialist disciplines that nurses can train us, but uh, neonatal care certainly is one that we really want to competencies and that there is an opportunity for um, more advanced qualification. But we also need implementation research to look at um, how this works in different settings. I don't know if there will be a, a, a one-size-fits-all approach for different countries, but I think Cornella can certainly talk about the roadmap for human resources. And I think also there's um, a critical issue to consider is thinking about the fact that it's not just numbers of nurses that we need, but also the skill set that those nurses have and ensuring that there is the financing in place to increase the number of health workers needed to care for newborns. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. There is um, a related question to, to the workforce, but about financing this time. It's, it's not a question, it's a comment from my English on um, the need to talk about finance for HRH and nursing. Otherwise, the policy and the training will have no effect. And you mentioned that in Kenya, the key issue is um, inadequate financing for the health workforce. Um, and there are many graduating nurses that have no employment in nursing at all. He said that having one neonatal nurse for every 26 newborns is not necessarily going to make a difference and improve care dramatically, but it's a matter of, of advancing um, or balancing, sorry, advanced skill and expanding the number of nurses. Do you have a comment or a response to that? 
Yes, I have a comment, and in fact, I want to say that the all uh, uh, I am very happy that the report on uh, on chaos more than sick and newborn was uh, uh, um, represented also an opportunity to start the discussion of neonatal nursing. I am absolutely aware because I was working for many years in Mozambique and other countries in the field at field level the challenges that uh, the lack of human resources and competent human resources in new, newborn health exists, in newborn services exist. And what we are, how we are approaching the issue in WHO with our partners interested in newborn health is now in starting and pushing the discussion on these topics. And actually we are preparing a document, many of you have also commented, I think, and uh, a document that uh, offer options uh, uh, for countries to resources, the teams that uh, take care, they should be present for the care of, of uh, small and sick newborns. And so there are options for uh, uh, both from the point of view of training, improving the numbers, for improving the capacity, but also from the point of view of improving the qualifications, you know, the and also the environment, the conditions, uh, and the payment as well. So we uh, are trying to work on this uh, issue. It's not uh, that simple because uh, the um, because uh, newborns are not uh, so high in the agenda. There are many many competing priorities, but uh, we are confident that uh, with the with the road roadmap for human resources for uh, neonatal services, we will make uh, an advancement. And then, of course, the competencies uh, are uh, important, uh, and uh, the um, and if and building a commitment for this area of work, basically, so countries will invest uh, also in neonatal nursing as a specific cadre. Uh, uh, one for twenty-six, one nurse for twenty-six, uh, twenty is not uh, something that can ensure quality of care, even if you have uh, the parents in alpha cities. Yeah, there is no way. I will. Thank you. Thank you. I just uh, comment um, yeah. on, on the finance aspect. Um, I, I think we also need to uh, start to the unconverted. We managed to we tend to speak to ourselves as healthcare practitioners and policymakers, but the people who actually hold the money are within the ministries of finance, and it's important that. Um, uh, we start developing uh, investment cases for human resources for health and demonstrate what it actually means not to have adequate, um, for instance, neonatal nurses or just nurses within newborn unit and the implications on quality, um, outcomes and uh, long-term disabilities. And those are the languages that people within the ministries of finance will understand. And colleagues within the next 360 are embarking on uh, those pieces of work and you know trying to generate that evidence to support other countries uh, with that piece of evidence and thank you Nera for the different policy options as that you know bringing together that and the speaking to ministries of finance that might address that and and then thinking up about what nursing um, skills we need uh, within newborn units I agree that you know specialist nurses are important, but uh, it takes time, effort, money to train people, and we we need to get to the uh, a, a very critical balance on um, the right uh, skill mix within those units, and it might just be necessary to get a few people with specialist training in the first instance to mentor others as we go along and and do the critical mass of nurses. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, David. We had a, a comment from Caroline McLean on on uh, the workforce and uh, competency, saying that Europe is suggesting a common curriculum and competency for management of all smoke and sick newborns, um, and that we can check the European Foundation for Care of Newborn Infants information on that. I now have another question again for the the, the bigger presentation on the chapter. So for Sarah and Onela from Harish Kumar asking if you can elaborate on development, developmentally supportive care with evidence-based intervention beside KMC and breastfeeding. You are on mute, so Onela and Sarah, you need, either of you need to unmute yourself. 
Yes, uh, thank you. Yeah, the the standards uh, ensuring quality of care in uh, health facilities uh, uh, list the intervention have uh, a list of intervention, including also the inputs, the requirements uh, for implementing those interventions. And uh, we have, uh, and on top of that, we are uh, also almost ready. I hope in one month we will release uh, the standards of care for small and sick newborn, which uh, are even more detailed on what are the interventions that should be made available in our facilities for uh, managing this kind of babies. And uh, in the report also, you can find uh, the uh, interventions by level of care that are recommended and of course uh, each country needs to make those lists uh, depending on their resources and uh, and then of course there are guidelines uh, that you can refer to for uh, uh, WHO guidelines you can and other international guidelines you can refer to um, and the references are in again in the standards for uh, to know why we recommend the one thing instead of the, another one basically with the evidence behind the recommendations. I hope it's good enough for my answer. And if you, if needed, the links to the several um, documents. Thank you. Um, the YouTube website. Uh, yeah, I'm going to take four more questions. The next one is for David from Alex Rowe asking uh, whether you could say more about the problems with the processes of care that you saw in the study. Um, that was it. That was not immediately in the presentation. Um, thank you, Alex, for that question. Um, I, I think there were quite many aspects uh, linked to it, and uh, I want to speak maybe more objectively and say that, as, as you probably noticed, the private sector had very low occupancy rates, and private sector also in Kenya sometimes don't tend to follow standards and guidelines. So. Um, just to backtrack a little bit is that we evaluated process of care in terms of uh, how well people were assessing babies at admission uh, diagnosis uh, the adherence to recommended treatment and um, uh, and other investigations that were required and what we found is that uh, surprisingly even when the public sector was very overwhelmed they tended to provide better quality of care uh, compared to the private sector and that could be linked to the very low occupancy rates that um, uh, might uh, suggest that it's very difficult to maintain those skills but also with regards to structure uh, so for process of care we use the national uh, guidelines and within the pediatric uh, uh, guidelines there is a section for newborns and we also use uh, the same guidelines on the minimum requirements in terms of structure, the resources. So in terms of lab capacity, uh, what do you need? So for, for example, for immediate resuscitation and other equipment and resources needed within the newborn unit and evaluated how much of that was available within the facilities that were providing 24 seven inpatient care. And again, uh, that was uh, pretty well available over 80% uh, in most places. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, I have a comment and a question for Ted Bab on the COVID-19 slide that she shared. Uh, the first one is a comment on people not people not or mother not seeking care anymore and not showing up in health facility um, now under the COVID-19 pandemic. And that it's a challenge both on, the, on that side and also on the side on the PPE. And then a question from Mohammed Aziz Khan asking whether you can give some specific of the PPE and standard precaution that should be taken while giving KMC uh, in a home setting during COVID. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, I, it is, there is a, 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 an issue, uh, community level, uh, you know, meets and also health workers and some of it is valid. So this is, you know, uh, an important uh, issue that needs to be addressed through the risk communication strategy that targets both, you know, parents, uh, the community in general, and health workers. 
And uh, this has to go in line with making sure that health facilities are uh, safe. Health facilities are not a place, you know, where um, uh, transmission is uh, going on. And for that also, there is a very clear guidance, a very clear strategy. If you have seen uh, the WHO uh, IPC strategy during COVID, it clearly uh, outlines uh, based on the different uh, stages of the, the pandemic in the country. Uh, so if that guideline is properly followed and implemented, uh, the risk is really, really minimized. And as we know also, um, uh, at the moment, you know, newborns um, and the pregnant mothers are not the ones who are, uh, you know, the sources of infection. Some of the concern is just, you know, uh, a myth about the risk. Uh, regarding PPE also, you know, in that same IPC guideline, you will see that the IPC use needs to be based on risk. Uh, if the procedure is has, you know, a minimal risk, a person does not need to have the full PPE, uh, just, you know, specific to that um, clinical procedure the health worker is going to conduct. So there needs to be a proper education support uh, of health workers and making sure health facilities are safe. Uh, again, also uh, on the same IPC guideline, there is clearly outlined uh, the, the different IPC measures that needs to be in place for the different level of risk. So whether that is for KMC or for essential newborn care or for um, uh, providing care in the NICU, uh, that guideline will provide you. And you can find those guidelines at the WHO website. And also, uh, CDC and the WHO has given a series of webinars on IPC. And you can also access those. Thank you very much, Ted Bab. Um, I have a last question finally for Kara. Um, which I think you, your colleagues uh, on, on the call are, are going to answer on how the TPP is linked to UNICEF procurement. Um, great question. Uh, we've gotten that a lot. Um, I will refer to my colleagues at UNICEF Supply Division, um, Christopher Gabriel, um, is on the line. Uh, Christopher? You can yes. unmute. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Um, yeah, so as you've seen, we've issued the TPPs on our website, which is a standard practice for us to do when we want to go in and drive uh, development and procurement of new innovative products. So what we'll do is that we're going to go through these products uh, one by one to see where they're at in the development stage and then evaluate which ones um, do we want to go straight to procurement with, which ones do we maybe want to engage to um, somehow drive R&D in, in in, to the degree that's possible. Um, and and then link it all to demand. So it's important to keep in mind that standard UNICEF procurement is reactive to demand. So we're waiting for the demand until we start the procurement. We are in this situation gonna push forward and, and in a selective way um, look at how we can put uh, include products in our catalog without necessarily having them in demand up front to see how we can use that to catalyze uptake. Um, but we will have a very close eye on where demand is coming from and to what degree things are happening as basis for deciding ahead. Um, but the fundamental message is right now that the first step is the TPP is being out and we'll then, we're then going to work structured uh, in our review of these to conclude on how to best uh, drive these forwards to either drive the development in or to drive the procurement. Thank you very, very much. This is uh, the end of our Q&A session because we're running out of time. A few questions could be not be answered um, that I will share with the presenter afterwards. We are going to send the presentations and the recording to all of you and also on the Creative Care Network website. Ted Bab, over to you to close the session, please. Thank you. Thank you, uh, colleagues, for joining us for this uh, today's discussion. Please check out the webinar series. Uh, at the website uh, you see on your slide. Also remember to register for the next webinar, which will be uh, in June uh, 17. Uh, this will be on, uh, the, the title is Ensure That They Thrive. It will be on early childhood development. And there will be, uh, the same as today, we will have two sessions, as you see, at 8 a.m. and 11 a.m. Uh, GMT. And also join us on the conversation at the, these hashtags.
So thank you, and we're looking forward to see you in the upcoming webinars as well. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Bye.